Welcome everybody to Sea Machines. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wenda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I would like to welcome Dean Juanju to give a few words. Thank you, Jason, and welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Joan Du. Uh, I am the Dean of the Daniel Sack Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design, and I want to give you a big warm welcome in the morning for attending our day-long exciting sessions. Uh, our contributors today comprise a diverse roster of internationally recognized scholars and practitioners with an interest in environmental history, technology, and design. Their focus for this occasion centering on sea machines and how they have shaped specific forms and landscape in history and in the present. This topic is timely given the increased precarity of our oceans in the face of climate change and the need to examine the role of architecture and design in our necessary adaptation to this environmental and technological reality. As a uniquely diverse institution hosting a range of disciplines, it is Daniel's aim to host such boundary crossing dialogues, both for this occasion and also in the future. Only by thinking of the built and natural environments as one holistic unit, can we begin to address these challenges. I'd like to thank professors Christy Anderson and Jason Ewan's creation and also contributions today and uh, advance thanks to all the speakers on sharing their works and explorations with us uh, throughout the day. So with that, I want to say I look forward to all the presentations and all the discussions um, to you, Christy. Thank you, Dean Du, for those very kind words of welcome. And um, welcome everyone, uh, to speakers and the audience. Um, Jason and I would like to start the event by saying a few words about our thinking about the project, um, how we sort of came about to putting it together. And I will now share my screen. Um, so welcome, I'm Christy Anderson, co-organizer of this event with Jason Nguyen, and um, I'll offer a few brief words of introduction. When Jason, oh, sorry here. When Jason arrived in Toronto just a few years ago, we discovered shared um, interest his around trade and cartography, and mine in the ship as a counterpoint to terrestrial architecture in the use of its onboard spaces and in the materiality of the ship in its boards, sails, and rope. Jason and I very quickly found a specific object of shared interest in this 1715 map by Hermann Moll. The so-called COD map shows North America and the North Atlantic with a particular emphasis on the routes taken by Captain Hudson and Captain James in the 16th and 17th century. The visual emphasis is on the North and on the sea. Mole's map shows the industry of migratory cod fishing and we see that here in process. The mechanism is made clear in the ship just offshore that brought the fishers as well as the supplies to the Great Bank of Newfoundland each year. Mole shows the land architecture and the sea structures in close proximity. And in the case of the migratory fishery, that was particularly true for the sails and the riggings from the ship were used to create the tent-like roofs of the stages and housing where the men lived and worked. Ships were a form of modular technology held together by miles of rope and able to be fitted out and repaired as exchangeable parts. Ships are an assemblage of things. The various elements used to create any particular ship only make sense when the whole is bound together. 
Ships are also communities of people, often disparate, brought together into this limited and defined space. The hierarchies of command extended throughout the crew, where each brought specific skills and knowledge needed for the operation of the ship. A ship might be simple or complex, yet must always account for the unique conditions of its operation, water and wind. Buoyancy and mobility define ships of any era, or to be more precise, ships that continue to float. For the unforgiving edge of the shore is also a condition of sea machines, just often an unwelcome condition of failure. As machines and constructed spaces, ships and boats are not incidental or optional for humans wishing to exist on the water. We cannot survive, at least not for very long, without some form of interface between us and any waterscape. Some of the very earliest images we have include smaller boats next to larger, more complex ships and showing a variety of types. The technical system of boats was shaped by the conditions of use, whether oceanic travel or movement alongside the land from settlement to settlement. The scale, complexity, and even the imagery of ships could reflect and promote political and social agendas as much as any terrestrial building. If kings or corporate institutions saw ships as the means to greater political, military, and economic ends, then this also involved an expanding cast of professional players with specific expertise, depending on the size of the vessel and the intended function infrastructure on a ship comes out into the open. Here, the shipwright Peter Pett adopts the pose of the designer of the great bulk of King Charles's warship, dividers in hand, much as similar portraits do of architects. Architects have long seen the connection within their own profession, as Alberti did in referring to the ship as a mobile fortress. And at various times up to the present, the challenges of designing for the water has had an irresistible pull. Ships are structures on the water. The most iconic of ships, the Ark, was certainly understood to be a shelter on the sea. Craftsmen in the foreground of this, the Bedford Duke of Hours manuscript, use tools specific to shipbuilding, yet create a four square timber framed multi storied house, though the image is identified as the construction of Noah's Ark. This manuscript artist reiterated these connections between land and sea in the landscape and seascape in the distance. If ships can be seen as a kind of building with essential and unforgiving requirements, it also shaped the architecture of the land through the movement of wealth and the transport of materials. There are few land-based buildings that did not come into being or come into meaning without ships. Ports evolved to allow for an exchange of goods labor and capital, whether for trade or military functions. But the structures of shipbuilding centers facilitated the transformation of the raw materials of wood, hemp, and flax into the ships themselves. This process was ongoing as ships required continual refitting and repair as water always destroys structural stability. The close alliances between ships and architecture appear in many different forms, as we shall see in the talks today, yet in one essential way they exist in different realms. The possibility of a perfectly ordered world, as utopian as that vision was, could never exist in the unruly, nonlinear, and unknowable seascape. There, even the best of machines can fail. Um, I will turn the um, uh, screen over to Jason to talk a bit about the uh, organization of the day and um, uh, 
thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christy. Uh, my name is Jason Nguyen, and I'm an assistant professor here at the Daniels faculty and one of the organizers of the symposium. Uh, the impulse to design and construct what we are calling sea machines speak to forces that are essential to architecture and architectural thinking, notably those related to economics, culture, technology, and the environment. Ships are central to global trade and their design and operation requires the confrontation with the climatic and ecological conditions of the sea. It is of little coincidence that the earliest known extant depiction of a ship is found here, carved into the facade of the Borbudur Buddhist monument in central Java, Indonesia, or one of the earliest extant um, depictions. The double rigor illustrates how art, trade, and technology have intersected through the form of the ship for centuries. Sea Machines is organized into three sessions that interrogate the connections between marine technology and architecture, those being infrastructure, culture, and energy. These categories allow a synthetic and interdisciplinary analysis of maritime technology for the history and theory of architecture, while also attending to the specific historical and regional circumstances of different case studies. We have speakers today coming from traditions that might not often be in dialogue, including those from architecture, art history, landscape, the history of science and technology, environmental history and theory, and of course, maritime history. Infrastructure, the theme of our first session, is of central importance for any discussion on the architecture of the sea. Logistical sites like container ships, ports, and warehouses are the structures that undergird the market and commodities. The standardization, mobility, and abstraction of the shipping container renders it the ultimate space of global capitalism and supply chain operations. There is a history that predates our contemporary systems of capitalism, of course. Developments in, uh, developments in maritime technology, navigation, cartography, and finance supported the globalization of trade and exchange in the early modern world. Littoral sites like ports and trading zones served as nodes that territorialized the sea, ones, of course, whose establishment often relied on colonial expansion, empire building, and the subjugation of human life. The extraction and trade of natural resources, such as pearls, coral, fish, among others, relied on forms of labor that often unfolded along racial and gendered lines. In this regard, the actions and operations below the waterline serve as a rejoinder to the celebration of the sea as a kind of social, environmental, or technological frontier. Our second session attends to the culture of the ship, from the design and articulation of its forms to the social realities that its isolation engenders. Ornamental carvings chronicle seafaring myths, naval battles, and tales of commercial trade. In the 19th and 20th centuries, ocean liners such as the SS Normandy served as models for modern architects, Le Corbusier among others, specifically in the ways that their streamlined design spoke to questions of functionality Industrious, industriousness and beauty. In this regard, the ship set the template for design thinking as well as the potential luxuries of modern life. One might also consider the architecture of the ship as a form of cultural reckoning, noting its enduring legacy for political works of art and architecture, including pieces by Hank Willis Thomas at Grande Lyon. The architect was responsible for the Ark of Return, a monument at the United Nations in New York City that commemorates the history and legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. Images such as these illustrate the power and potency of the ship as a symbol of commemoration, the will to not forget, and the pursuit of justice. Our third session, Energy, speaks to the environments and technologies of the sea and seagoing vessels including desalination machines that made human occupation of the water possible. Steam technologies powered riverboats and later ocean liners, thus allowing sailors to negotiate and even overcome environmental forces such as prevailing currents and winds. More recently, there is a renewed embrace of wind-powered energy, 
noting the ocean bird concept being developed by Wolenius Marine and KHT Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, which aims to reduce fossil emissions by carrier and trade ships by up to 90%. In this regard, the study of maritime spaces is timely and of wide interest for scholars and practitioners alike, especially given the sea's increasing precarity in the face of climate change. Beyond the energy that might, um, beyond the energy that might power seagoing vessels, one might also consider the forms of vitality that shipwrecks might engender. Here, concepts of the posthuman help us to conceptualize the vast ecologies and ecosystems on the seabed, worms, shellfish, mollusks, and other more than human actors. Scholarly explorations of naval architecture and life in the Anthropocene gesture toward the very serious dangers posed by the threat of climate change. Indeed, proposals for floating cities, while fantastical on the screen, illustrate the social and environmental challenges that are impacting coastal societies across the globe, including and especially regions in the global south and along the poles that are suffering first and worse by rising and warming seawaters. Sea machines thus ask us to consider the central role that architecture has and might continue to play in charting a future environmental, technological, and social reality. On this note, Christy and I would like to thank those members of the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design, who, in addition to supporting this endeavor, continue to press the boundaries of architectural research and design. Dean Zhuangdu, of course, who has been a leader and steadfast advocate for research and public programming initiatives that address environmental and social resiliency. Former Associate Dean Robert Levitt, with whom Chrissy and I first spoke with our concept last year. Jeannie Kim, the current Associate Dean at the Daniels Faculty. Peter Seeley, the Interim Director of the PhD Program. Nini Broad, Hamid Nadi, and Tim Clark for the logistical support and wizardry. Uh, Katrina Quizon, a student in our honors undergraduate program who designed our fabulous website. Please take a look, seamachines.org. Um, it was truly a remarkable feat. And last but certainly not least, the students from whom Christy and I have learned immensely in courses directed here at the University of Toronto. For Christy, this includes seminars, Architecture in the Sea and Lequescence, which she is directing currently. And for me, this includes Sites of Exchange, Architecture and Capital Flows and um, architecture and extractive landscapes, ecologies and empires in the early modern world. I'm a bit more verbose than Christy. Uh, I would be remiss to not thank Christy also, who has been a rock of support during my first years here at the Daniels faculty, certainly a very precarious time to start a new position. We look forward to many conversations today and into the future your screen. Uh, and there will be a discussion um, at the end of, at the conclusion of each mm -hmm. of the three papers. Um, so next, uh, we have Carola Hein, who is a professor at the Faculty of Architecture at TU Delft, and she will be presenting Oil on Water, the Global Petroleum Scape, and the Urbanization of the Sea. So first of all, thank you very much for the introduction and for organizing this absolutely fascinating event. Uh, thanks also to Keller Esteling, who just uh, prefaced this, what I'm going to tell in a, in a beautiful way. And I think this idea of sea machines is, is wonderful and really inspirational for a lot of new research or different looks at uh, architecture, the sea, and um, well, questions that we are talking about. So when I, or the, the talk that I would like to give today is to connect the fields of petroleum flows, petroleum scape, and um, the port cities or the urbanization of the sea. And there's perhaps no better image to illustrate this than the oil trade flows worldwide. This is already a somewhat outdated image, a couple of years old, but I think it makes the point that much of the global oil is actually transported via the seas. And the links that come into being are maritime links. There are flows on ships. There are also financial links, flows of uh, money across the world. And there are flows of architectural ideas. So when you look at a map like this, you see specific nodes 
like here in the Middle East, as can be expected, and also in other places, including here in the North Sea or in Indonesia. Now, what these links do, and to bring it to the, to the field of architecture, is to connect, say, the highways in the United States to buildings like Burj Khalifa. So in order to understand what kind of buildings are erected where, at which point in time, we, at least that's what I would like to argue, have to look at the ways of petroleum flows, and that means at the urbanization of the sea. Now, the way that I've tried to, to conceptualize this idea of planetary urbanization, as Kala Esseling already mentioned, so the ideas promoted by Neil Brenner and, and Christian Schmidt, the idea that the cities that we see today draw on extended territories, and these extended territories also include sea spaces. So with this idea also building on Lefebvre's concept of spatial and representational and represented spaces, I've tried to give a architectural or a built environment meaning to these flows from the sea to the hinterland. This means that if we look at port city scapes, at port city territories, they include all the spaces from the sea, the ships, the drilling platforms, the pipelines, and the port industry. And let's keep in mind that the form of the ships, the growth of the ships, the uh, type of cargo they carry shapes the ports. And whatever happens in the port, at least on these port cities that are on the edge of sea and land, will determine how the cities look next to them. And it means what happens in auxiliary, what I call auxiliary territories, say also the schools and the uh, the leisure institutions, the museum, as well as the infrastructure. And many of these spaces are effectively shared spaces where what the logistics industry needs will collide with what citizen need and want. And so we see that these kinds of infrastructures, basically the, the containers that are carried here through or the, the, the other types of cargo, will end up on the streets, on infrastructure, on, on railways, until the hinterland, and that can, in some cases, be hundreds of kilometers inland in huge logistics centers. Now, these types of transformations, these spatial transformations over time, are accompanied by a whole story of representations. What do we see? Which part of this transport and this transformation is actually visualized and by who? Who issues historically postcards of the maritime trade and the spaces or the maps of the seas? And how is the industry itself representing it? And this becomes particularly encapsulated, I think, through this petroleum scape where we have linked spaces, a spatial imprint of a commodity, the petroleum, which goes from the refineries to the gas stations, to the administrative headquarters, and so on and so forth, and it is then represented in changing ways over time. Now, in this context, where is the location of the sea? And looking from the perspective of the sea towards land, I think changes our approach to architectural history to uh, understanding buildings and spaces in general. It means that we will look from the sea to the, well, we will look at the sea itself, but also from the sea to the land, which helps us overcome in many ways, national stories that are often written by national capitals or from the side of national capitals uh, that are in one single language. And here I'm clearly using the example of Europe because you can go 200 kilometers and leave the Netherlands where I'm located right now. But a ship coming from the sea can decide uh, whether it goes to Hamburg, Rotterdam, Antwerp, or any other port in a quite small distance, touching upon a different country every time. So together with Nancy Cooling, we edited the book Urbanization of the Sea, and this idea goes back also to, to Nancy's research on what is happening on the sea, how to extend the concept of planetary urbanization 
onto the sea territories. The idea that is also behind it is that we, whatever we do in terms of mapping, we have to visualize the fact that much is happening in the seas and that we have lost knowledge and understanding of these territories over time. And the fact of this, what we've called blankness, the blankness of these maritime territories today allows us in many ways to dump into them all the elements that we don't need or want on land or in the cities on the territories. Uh, as architecture historians, you may have looked at the history of Paris, for example, in the past, and you can see a similar history where you have the beautiful Paris surrounded by its walls, and then all the institutions, the slaughterhouses, whatever you didn't need, ending up in the, in the banlieue, ultimately creating the, the communist belt, which was then later split up. And in a similar way, our land territories are now expulsing all these things that we don't want into the sea territories. And because they have become blank, they have been written into a certain blankness, our knowledge about these sea territories has been lost. And we look, and this is very clear again in, in visualizations, if we look at a map like this one, the Carta Marina from, from 1539, we clearly see that the sea is populated. There are sea monsters, there's all kinds of indications on them. It's not just a clean blue slate, it has depth, it has meaning, it is spatial, social, it is cultural. And even the way that traditionally we have looked at cities was much more complex than often the way that we do it today. So when you think about Venice, even in this image from Braun Hogenberg, you already see a, a, a recognition of the fact that Venice is not just an island, but that it's part of a larger lagoon, a territory where water is just as important as, as land. And then the ships, of all different scales and sizes are adapted and going in and out of the lagoon and towards the island. Now, the change between this understanding of the sea as a, as a territory has really changed with the fact of, the, um, of petroleum coming into the picture. So the, the moment that I would like to start here is the moment when the uh, industrial drilling of petroleum starts through the example of, of Titusville uh, in particular. And Titusville creates a moment which will quickly be replicated around the world where we have these um, territory where we have drilled uh, oil coming out of the ground and then new modes of transportation carrying the product to different parts around the world. And uh, so we have, for example, these, these flat boats uh, carrying the, them around the, the, the rivers, uh, trains being developed, storage sites. And there is an, an intimate relationship between water and land, between seas and continents. And I personally really love this image, which is the Atlantic refinery on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia in the 1870s. At that point, petroleum had only started to be extracted. There's whole stories to be told about railways and Rockefeller uh, and the development of port cities as hubs in this transfer of oil from the interior of the, the United States to uh, China. 50% I mean, of the oil was exported to China from, from Philadelphia at the time. But in the beginning, oil was stored in the center of the city, and it quickly became clear that there was um, too much danger. The fire danger, all kinds of uh, pollution dangers emerged, and the oil industry moved to the what was then suburbs. And you have maps that will say Apple Yard Oil Refinery, Apple Yard. And there, next to these blue waters and green pastures, we have sailing ships from what is, so the Atlantic refinery and what is today uh, ExxonMobil, uh, that was one of the first places. These companies were already so big at the time when lightning struck and destroyed six sailboats carrying petroleum that the company could rebuild without needing any um, insurance. 
So the idea of water, seas, sailboats, oil is one really of, of a future oriented and, and very appreciative uh, painting. And the, the black fumes coming out of our little vessel here are probably seen more as a promise of a brilliant future than one of um, disaster. And this connection between water and petroleum refineries, and I really like that Calary Silling already mentioned the landings, the port cities, the installations on land as part of this large sea machine. These refineries depended on water. And you can see that they needed the river both for the industrial practices as well as for shipping. So you will find many of these rivers, uh, these uh, oil refineries in these locations at the time still with the uh, places for the horses, and, but also a railway attached to it. Now, ships from the beginning on, uh, sailboats in earliest moments, and then tanker ships will reshape global geographies. And the example that I'm giving here is the SS Murix, so a ship built by the Shell Company, which then later came to, 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 together with the uh, Royal Dutch, which was the oil company um, from the Netherlands that was actively active in the Netherlands East Indies, so Indonesia today, and hence needed the contact from Indonesia to Europe. And, and they did want to have the transfer from between these continents, and they tried to avoid the link going all around uh, Africa and uh, wanted to use the Suez Canal. Now the Suez Canal was not, could not be crossed by sailboats with petroleum. So they had to take the long way round because of uh, uh, fire problems. And the, so the Shell company was the first to then build a tanker ship that fulfilled these fire requirements and was actually allowed to travel then through the, the Suez Canal. And that was the beginning for a whole transformation of, of territories with the creation of Suez City and other um, installations and new oil drilling platforms actually in Suez. So the, the shipping of oil effectively became a transformer of um, geospatial practice of, of the, the um, uh, geo, well, geogra geographies globally. And here an example of uh, Suez City emerging at the time. And this is still a time where we see here in Indonesia, oil being shipped in, in barrels around the world or um, here located near the ship. Now, this was the part of the, the kind of dirty oil, but these same flows and this petroleum scape also extended to the administrative headquarters here in New York or London or wherever you will look, these places emerged because of the presence of oil. And still up to the 1920s, 30s, this transfer of oil across the world was largely celebrated. And I really use the word celebrated here. When you look at the painting of Dunkirk, and this was a huge painting that was um, demonstrated in, in world fairs, you see the harbor itself as, in the, as being the main actor, the main piece of the whole um, painting. And this is, well, probably four or five meters wide and two, two meters high painting. But you also see the way in which the petroleum tanks here are bright, uh, bright and uh, white lighting up. So they really seem to be promising a beautiful future in the, for this uh, city on the, on the northern French coast. And actually right next to this, it's, uh, to these tanks, you will see the development of a city for engineers. And at the time, this was a good place to live. It was great if you could climb over the fence to go to your refinery. Things that are very difficult to imagine uh, in that way today from a um, environmental perspective. Now, the part of the oil did not only stay in oil transportation in ships that, that carried oil, but it's also uh, something that was, well, that was happening in all kinds of ships. These ships were fueled by oil. Effectively, 
the need to find new fuels for for um, for entire countries was also part for was driving the colonization efforts. So uh, when Churchill decided that ships, military ships, should be fueled by oil, that also gave an uh, an impulse to uh, colonial or to colonizing Iran or to dealing with Iran and British petroleum moving into there. So we've already had this idea of how did these big ocean liners carry their um, rich, often rich clients or clients across the, across the oceans. And we see on these ships, precedent, precedents to like here the Titanic, uh, the way that people were living on them were, well, um, could expose their entire culture to them. Now, on the one hand, we have these big ships that are fueled by and driven by oil, and we have the oil carriers that will connect different parts of the world, the Zoroaster that I just showed you, or the drilling towers here in Baku, or the, the, the refineries. So there's a whole industrial landscape that is necessary to facilitate the uh, travels of the rich elite on the earliest cruise uh, ships that were emerging at the time or on big ocean liners like the Titanic. And with this back and forth of oil drilling, I just mentioned the fact that BP went into uh, Iran and particularly southern Iran, Khuzestan here, building pipelines, building streets, draining the oil, refining the oil, and at the same time exporting urban practices. So the structure of Abadan in Iran, for example, here has similar to what we just saw in, in Dunkirk. Uh, so building a refinery, setting up all the oil industry and just next to it, also developing urban housing for uh, the, the expatriates from Britain, for workers, developing everything from kindergarten to, uh, to local practices, and even turning it into something that is a postcard that is being celebrated as an achievement. Look how we can export the garden city idea to a different part of the world as a kind of exchange for the, um, for the, the drilling of the oil and the oil export. So the idea of lifting the country uh, out, of the, out of the practices and we see these similar um, developments all around the world. This is a, a, an example from the United States, which we've called the, the North American Petroleum Scape, which is often the, the first, the, uh, the, the foundational petroleum scape where many of these activities occur first. So let me just briefly give you a view on how this petroleum scape uh, lands on, 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 on a site like, uh, like Rotterdam and the kind of um, mapping and initiatives that we've been doing to visualize it. So this is the Rotterdam area where I'm now with a port of some 50 kilometers long from the center of the city to the mass flag to two and some of the, the automated ports that Keller Esterling was showing first are exactly in that area. Now, this transformation of the, the port here from 1910 happened not only in one site. The input of the ships was not just on the river here, which is a canal that will have its 150th anniversary soon next year, uh, this year actually, uh, the transformation of the port itself, but it's also anchored in the administrative headquarters uh, here in The Hague nearby. And in all these infrastructures from bridges to railways that connect the port to the other areas. For example, the construction of an airport here on the south side of the river was directly related to what was going on in London so that the expatriates could fly over and not take, have trouble getting over the river to the south side. And similarly here, you have the development of the um, headquarters right next to the Dutch ministries. So this machine has an impact on cities transforming both the industrial sites, the petroleum refinery sites, but also the decision-making sites 
And here is an example of how big this has grown uh, by 2000. Now, the uh, let me just go back for a second. So when we look at these developments here, it there is really a transfer from in the 1970s where many refineries globally uh, had been lost to the Western oil companies, where new refineries are built on the European soil to guarantee energy security in Europe. Now, this is the growth here, uh, which also is a period where then oil is being found in uh, the North Sea, which I mentioned before, which requires yet another infrastructure on the sea. So it's no longer just about ships. It's also about huge drilling platforms like Ecofisk here, where you have really an interconnected system of platforms at the size of a, of a city. And this sectorial of this organization of the sea is mirrored then again in, um, in, in legal structures and national boundaries. And let's not forget that when we look at a piece of the North Sea, like the one we have here, so this is Denmark, Germany, and then going into the Netherlands, that these areas in the sea are also split up in terms of national boundaries and influence zones. So Germany, for example, may end up with a very weird formed um, place. And all of these are then clearly divided up into different uh, places where you could place windmills, et cetera, et cetera. And so these monsters, like the here's the, uh, the, the big um, drilling platform that is being um, shipped out for dismantling but these huge sea machines have captured the oceans have taken up a lot of spaces and among all these big ships that we've seen and heard about before the oil tankers are uh, the, among the hugest ones when you look at things like the knock davis here or um, and others now these huge scales of the sea machines and fueled by petroleum them includes the big cruise ships you've probably all heard the debates about the cruise ships in the front of of venice which is now forbidden but that same discussion goes out gone in in many other cities in the case of hamburg for example hamburg was say the um, named green capital of europe but however much we do in terms of sustainability uh, of the what is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the Hafen City here with the old Speicherstadt, as soon as there was a, a cruise ship that was not um, that was still burning its motors, well, you had a huge pollution of the city nearby. The city is now working with uh, electric plugins to avoid the, this kind of pollution directly next to the city, but that doesn't mean that they are not polluting on the oceans themselves. So when we look at these sea machines, at this occupation of the sea, I think it's urgent to think about what do we do with these remnants? How do we celeb celebrate them? How do we recognize them? How do we think about the petroleum and port city heritage of the future? And I find the Petroleum Museum in Stavanger as an architectural object really fascinating because it picks up on the oil imagery like the oil drums here it sits on the sea it looks at the past of oil in norway but also its future and then there are plenty of places uh, this is just almost next to my house where you have a little gas station for the ships so there are plenty of places where the whole shipping industry is really anchored in our everyday um, in our everyday uh, movements so what we are looking at today is to make and to build on these maps that I showed you earlier, is to try and develop an atlas of 100 port city territories around Europe. So this on the four seas, so this would be again the North Sea, and to see how these sea machines, how these uh, sea flows have shaped the different territories, overlapping both their traditional their historically formed, their geographical situation, and then looking at what kind of um, forms the port has taken in relation to the city and the territory next to it. So this is a, a book that we're currently developing. 
but I'm also using this approach um, for student teaching. And since I'm in an architecture school, these kinds of stories can then turn into student projects um, like this one, uh, which is also for Dunkirk, where the students rethink the relationship between sea and land. Uh, so this student came up with a design fiction or a dysfunctional utopia thinking about container ships that serve directly as shopping malls. So the, the people in this city have saved some historic monuments, but they're basically sitting on top of a closed refinery to gain the last drops of oil for medicinal and other purposes. For the rest, they use um, uh, windmills, but their main goal is gaming and shopping. And so that is then why all these containers are dropped here around the hill and the people themselves will go shopping in this context. Sometimes the students will take this story into different narratives. Here, how is oil and how ports anchored in, in Dunkirk? Uh, they are thinking, and I think this is really important in the context of the conference too, in terms of depth. What is the depth of water and how has this, so taking a sectional approach to the relation between city, land, uh, uh, port, city, and territory, and its depth, and developing then projects, in this case for the port of Rotterdam, thinking about the port, city, territory relationships from a different, from a different perspective. And let's not uh, forget, so I just wanted to mention this book, which is also, both books are available as open access books, so feel free to get them. Uh, to just download them. Um, but the idea is how these machines, how these territories of sea and land are interconnected, particularly on the coastlines as very viscous places. And just to end with the, this, the presentation that I just gave you uh, was both about the, the urbanization of the sea and the petroleum scape, but the way in which we have shaped our energy landscapes of the past is also um, predating or determining our energy scapes of the future, as for example, the windmills on the sea, which are part of this blankness of the ocean on which we now seem to be able to project anything that doesn't fit anywhere else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Corolla. I would like to remind um, all of our participants and guests uh, that in the chat, we've included longer bios of all of our speakers, as well as links to some of their publications. Um, so thank you again, Corolla. That was fabulous. Uh, our next speaker is Prita Meyer. Uh, Prita Meyer is a professor at the Department of Art History and the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. And she will be presenting Below the Waterline, Dallas and the Politics of Heritage in the African Indian Ocean. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who made uh, my participation in this con uh, symposium possible. I'm really excited to participate and I'm especially excited and glad to see interesting connections and commonalities um, uh, between my paper and the two papers um, preceding mine. So today I'm sharing with you a work in progress in which I explore the complicated historical, social, and material entanglements of the Tao, which is an Indian Ocean vessel. I argue that uh, an infra infrastructural framing helps us unsettle still trenchant ideas about territory and civilizational difference. Put differently, I am, my main aim here today is to reimagine geographies of global capitalism, not through common sense categories, but by bringing seemingly disparate objects and events into the same frame. To do so, I'm drawing on scholars who center the African Indian Ocean in accounts of global capitalism. By considering the infrastructural uh, dimension of the Tao, I foreground the connections and entanglements of places and societies 
usually understood as technologically, temporally, and culturally distinct. Now from the outset, I want to emphasize I have not done ethnographic research on Daos. I have not spoken to Dao captains, sailors, or their owners. But my student, Nidhi Mahayan, who is now a professor at UC Santa Cruz, has done so. And she has shown that while the Dao trade has, of course, drastically contracted, many do still ply old routes. They're finding an economic niche in East Africa, transporting smaller volumes of cargo across the Western Indian Ocean going where containerized ships cannot or will not go. I draw on her incredible fine-grained work here. Further, I recently taught a seminar on the African Indian Ocean, where students and I focused on maritime vessels as architecture and infrastructure extensively. My ideas presented here are very much also indebted to these students. My interest in the Dao comes out of an investment in the oceanic and waterborne inter itinerancy as an unsettling frame from which to contemplate the world. Now I realize I'm in danger of conflating the heterogeneities, materialities and historical specificities of Daos. From the outset, I want to point out that the Dao is actually a catch-all phrase for a whole range of handmade wooden maritime vessels. The very idea that there is a single object called the Dao very much is the result of the homogenization, pro homogenization process of, the, of 19th century colonization. The Dao is very much an object um, of the colonial gaze. I also do not want to relegate the Dao only to the representational, symbolic, or referential, but instead see it as part of a system of material forms that structure and enable flows of people, commodities, ideas, and energy through networks. The Dao itself is infrastructure and is nested within other materials and technologies of capital. My formulation is clearly in depth indebted to uh, Brian Larkin's interest in the aesthetic dimension of infrastructure, which allows us to think of how infrastructure is, quote, always, um, how infrastructure, quote, always exists as forms separate from their purely technological functioning and that emerge out of and store within them forms of desire and fantasy. Infrastructure can take on fetish-like aspects that sometimes can be wholly autonomous from their function, end of quote. In countless conversations with Kenyan and Tanzanian heritage experts, uh, especially local museum professionals, <clears throat> the Dao always returns as the preeminent symbol of local pride and heritage. <clears throat> Daos are ever present in the public material, uh, in the public material and image cultures of the region. Festivals and museums use them as their iconic image of self-representation. And a range of nations uh, across the Western Indian Ocean are vying to claim the Dao as their national heritage. <clears throat> The Dao is celebrated um, as <clears throat> the Dao is celebrated for bringing into the present ancient cultures of seafaring and oceanic mobility. <clears throat> Daos are understood to be part of the mobile architecture of the region, creating shared ways of being across great distances. There are countless of projects that seek to create a nationalist narrative around the Dao, which is rather ironic, considering that in fact, one cannot anchor it in a single territory or in a single story of origins. There is indeed something romantic and inspiring about the Dao. 
It is undoubtedly extremely photogenic, and there are millions of Dao photographs and cinematic vignettes out there, usually presenting it as a silhouetted mysterious mass gliding across the sea at sunset. Dao's have been used for hundreds of years, connecting the various ports of the region since likely around the 10th through 13th century. On the Swahili coast of Eastern Africa, the Dao is typically a one-masted ship, with a unique lantern sail structure that relies on monsoon winds for mobility. Perfected over the centuries of craft, production, and use and repair, the Dao provided the backbone of Swahili transoceanic trade. Early Swahili Dao's were actually pretty small vessels meant for short regional trips. From the 13th century onward, Wealthy Swahili merchants purchased larger dhows made from sturdy timber in Persia and India, capable of hauling heavy goods over long distances. The dhow was the key oceanic transport transportation and travel vehicle. In fact, the very wealth necessary to build port towns along the Swahili coast came from a mixed economy of dhow importation and exportation. Merchant families built their fortune through employing shipbuilders and sailors who mastered the monsoon winds through and with the Dao. Swahili merchants sent out goods such as mangrove, copal gum, ivory, and gold coins seen here on the left, and bringing in porcelain, rugs, tapestry, bronze, and jade statuary, among other um, um, goods. All of the coral stone construction of Swahili port cities, which has been the focus of my past work, were built with the wealth of merchant mar maritime capitalism. Import duties and port fees provided civil authorities with the funds to invest in public infrastructure, such as you see here. Although I'm cheating a little bit because this cistern here was built in the um, 1870s when steamships really brought in more wealth than Dows. Now, while we might think of the Dow as only a tr traditional charming form, more significant to heritage and culture than trade, this is in fact not the case. They are still fundamental to the informal economy of the Western Indian Ocean. That is, while in terms of tonnage, most trade today is dominated by huge container ships, small merchant houses who contract ships and uh, captains still thrive. Dows from South, uh, South Asia often go between East Africa and the Gulf, bringing cargoes of foodstuffs, electronics and clothing to Somalia and taking back charcoal and livestock. Others move along East Africa's coast between Mogadishu, Kisimayu, and Mombasa, supplying ports with mixed cargoes of tea, plastic products, and medicinal supplies, usually returning to Mombasa with empty holds or on occasion dried fish, a cheap source of protein that has a market on the coast and the interior of East Africa. They are thus embedded in the trade and social relations that span across India, the Middle East, and East Africa. Nidhi Mahajan writes beautifully about how seamen present their experiences on these trips as a kind of heterotopia that is imprecated in multiple sites, while their own Tao is also a distant and distinct space of daily life and even domesticity. Dows are therefore vital to the maritime economy and sociality of the region and are ever present in the historic Swahili port cities to this day. But it is, of course, the large mega ports meant for container carriers that are currently being built or remade that are the center of Indian Ocean hydro capitalism today. Virtually every country, every country. Um, on the African Indian Ocean coast has embarked on elaborate initiatives to expand their cargo handling capacities exponentially. 
Entirely new ports are being built in places like Lamu, Kenya, which will be a key node of the Lapset corridor, corridor in East Africa, one of the largest transnational infrastructure projects currently under construction. Officially launched in, 2005, in 2005, the corridor aims to connect the oil fields of South Sudan to a new port in Lamu. Lamu would become the most important Indian Ocean terminus for a rail land bridge that would eventually transverse the entire breadth of the African continent. For the Kenyan government, Lapset promises to transform Lamu into, quote unquote, the Dubai of Africa. Here, tanker berths, highways, oil pipelines, railways, airports, and fiber optic cables will converge. Lapset is central to Kenya's current national development vision, known as Kenya Vision 2030, which aims to turn Kenya into a middle-income country by 2030. With such continental aspirations, it is not surprising that Lapset has recently been adopted as one of the leading projects of the African Union and East African community. At the same time, the project is also part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has already been mentioned, and is financed by a global mix of institutions, including European and US American. In fact, the celebrated 2015 visit of President Obama to Kenya was also about signing agreements to have US firms participate in LAPSET. This project demonstrates, as many scholars have pointed out, how such mega infrastructures, infrastructure projects reiterate and reinvent colonial projects of territorial penetration, control, and exploitation. These are obviously, quote unquote, projects of empire. Yet it's also important to nu nuance these easy assessments. I'm part of an ongoing collaborative research project that seeks to reframe how infrastructure in African contexts is discussed. We frame Kenya's aspirations not as just performances of mimicry, nor as simply reiterating the political strategies and spatial imaginations inherited from the colonial era. Even though countries like Kenya have little bargaining power in today's global financial environment, they present their infrastructure projects as, a telling, as telling very much an opposite story, one of self-determination. In the past, I have co-authored work with one of my collaborators, Kenny Coopers, uh, that, have, uh, that has argued that uh, macro analyses of infrastructure miss the way local citizens remake infrastructures in ways that far exceed the expectations of bureaucrats, politicians, and engineers. They instead engender ways of being that have nothing to do with, sti with state managed uh, ideals of capitalism and consumption but are about bodily and aesthetic sovereignty. But it would also be naive not to see the violence and coloniality of infrastructure. Many local residents have and continue to resist Lapset in Lamu. To them, the project is a neo-colonialist, capitalist-driven folly, representing the latest iteration of the central government to unhome Swahili-speaking Muslims in Kenya. Swahili Coast Society is a minority Muslim society in a largely Christian nation who are often seen as suspicious, suspicious outsiders by mainlanders. The distrust between mainlanders and coastal people is the result of very complicated histories and relations, but it also has to do with the fact that coastal Muslims are often not seen as authentic Africans or indigenous, that, uh, that is that they are not rooted in land enough. They are too much of the ocean. Lamu's Africanity is always in question. Although the historic town's significance to Kenya's tourism industry cannot be overstated, at least before the region had become associated with various insurgencies. In this context, the town is usually celebrated as a place where time has stood still which you can very much see from this UNESCO assessment of the town. Even, uh, even the Lapset Development Authority conjures Lamu 
uh, conjures Lamu's ancient relationship to wa water and the Indian Ocean world, since it has a Tao as its logo, which you can see here on its website on the upper left hand corner. Although Lapset will completely erase this town's remoteness and also likely those aspects that are considered picturesque and charming by outsiders. It is also very much destroying local cultural heritage and the environment. What has been completely obscured in recent accounts of these struggles surrounding Lapset is that in many ways it does not represent a new phenomenon. Rather, Swahili Coast residents have always engaged in competitive port making since at least the 12th century, their success resting on cultivating affiliations with other Indian Ocean littoral societies. Oceanic trade can be seen as the core of Swahili urbanity. In fact, the local Lamuans working for the National Museums of Kenya or the NMK are the ones who are finding themselves in a contradictory, even impossible in-between position. And part of my project is to understand how the archeological and material past is being remade through these massive interventions. This is where the Tao returns to my discussion. All of the major port buildups, including those being spearheaded by the most powerful central government agencies like the Kenya Port Authority and foreign investors like the government of Oman, are promising either to build new majestic DAOs like in Dubai or rehabilitate existing DAOs in conjunction with new museum projects. National and transnational stakeholders seek to make these massive infrastructure interventions seem somehow more benign because massive container ships are presented as simply following in the quote unquote ancient tradition of DAOs. This anodyne image of the DAO is supposed to have a sweet numbing and calming effect, suggesting that all of these, that these are all continuities, not ruptures or upheavals. But of course, this is very much a colonialist strategy, or at least it's strikingly similar to older strategies of delegitimization and non-recognition. The British administration, as I had already mentioned, had reduced the Tao to a picturesque anachronism and presented European controlled trading vessels as the only really legitimate form of trade in the Indian Ocean. As I had mentioned previously, the very moniker Tao emerged within a British imperial context, making it very much interchangeable with native vessel. It is no accident that it is exactly at this time that postcards and stamps and other souvenirs of Tao's prolif proliferate, making it an oriental other uh, uh, in the colonial imaginary. Now, this is not only in terms of pictorial strategies. The British Empire reconfigured trade networks and commercial and maritime landscapes that in effect rendered the Tao completely invisible. But this was not in, but this was because in the 19th century, Tao still played an essential role in the infrastructure of capitalism, so much so that they were seen as a threat to British control and British profits. During the colonial period, Tao captains used a whole host of tactics to sidestep British surveillance. They would register their Tao's by different names and complement Tao networks by the use of fishing boats, loading and unloading cargo at smaller ports and docks, and at some instances, um, traveling without light. In many ways, DAOs sought out invisibility as legal regimes increasingly made them illegal. But the most effective illegalization was to make the DAO stand for quote unquote Arab slavery. Now, I don't have too much time to go into details, but the, uh, but the British abolition movements, which were spearheaded by missionaries, were very much instrumentalized by the colonial administration. 
It is also very true that communities of East and Central Africa were absolutely devastated by old and new institutions of slavery that abused and degraded thousands of people in the developing crash crop plantation economy. Yet it also must be remembered that slavery was part of a continuum of capitalist globalization. Certainly there was nothing particularly Arab about it, especially in the 19th century um, when, the chattel, when chattel versions of slavery became dominant. And it was never a matter of Arab slavery since slavery was a continent, transcontinental and transcultural system that involves people now ethnicized as African, Arab, South Asian, or European. Further, the age of abolition in Africa was, not, was only the beginning of harrowing labor regimes under European colonial dem, uh, domination. Laboring for European sisal farms was a continuation of unfreedom and exploitation in many ways and also in new ways. But I also want to emphasize that I am in no way an apologist for slaving in the Indian Ocean world. Did Arabs from the Gulf play a central role in the expansion of global capitalism and modern chattel slavery in the region? Yes. I reject following many feminist and post-colonial scholars, the idea that Indian Ocean slavery was somehow more benign or not about anti-blackness as it was in the Atlantic world. world. It absolutely was. And historical evidence lays that bare. My argument is rather that it is important to realize that the Dow, in fact, remained a vital machine moving within the larger transport infrastructure of the colonial world. The British colonial system strategically reduced the Dow to its other, the Arab or native Dow, as a strategy of disavowal, silencing their own entanglements and the continuities of the very inequities that were supposedly relegated to the pre-colonial past. Evacuating the Dao and much of the Indian Ocean world of, its dark, of, the, of this darker side of oceanic mobility is in fact pervasive in all of the post-colonial national heritage pro projects of the countries of the Western Indian Ocean. This is also the case in Tanzania, a country with an, a country with an African majority. There are in fact no redemptive public memorials or attempts at reckoning with slavery and experiences of enslavement in public spaces. There are many reasons for this, all of them not easily talked about in Kenya and Tanzania. Slavery is everywhere and nowhere on the Swahili coast as it is in many other places, perhaps closer to home to us. Modernity's body politic of turning humans into transportable property to be continuously displaced across vast ocean has many continuities. And this, moder and this modernity is neither Western or non-Western, Arab or African or European, but transcends these mnemonicers and civilizational markers that seek to draw boundaries and, cre and create simple oppositional narratives. Thank you. Thank you, Prida. And um, we have time now, about 20 minutes um, for some questions. So I will, I will start people off while, um, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the um, Q&A tab down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and there were many things I thought that came up between the three talks. And I think the first thing that I would love to know um, a bit more about, and really uh, this I think applies to all three speakers. So if anyone wants to jump in is the questions about scale um, and the questions about um, the difference between thinking of a kind of local or regional experience versus the kind of global or um, transnational or trans uh, um, trans landmass, because one of the things that that uh, 
uh, Jason and I have been thinking a lot about in terms of water is how on the one hand, water as a substance, as a material, obviously mm -hmm. has um, the sort of uncontainability, but on the other hand is extremely local and the conditions of particular places, literally geographical or topographical conditions are quite um, different. So either if people have thoughts about um, how scale figures in to their, their work or how that might um, shape the discussion, um, I'll kind of open it up if anyone would like to jump in. Um, I'm happy to jump in uh, to get us started, hopefully. Um, so I think, you know, what you um, uh, address here is that, of course, these are one of some of the foundational challenges of thinking with the oceanic or um, with in these sort of uh, large scale comparative frameworks when we move beyond the area study paradigms or we move beyond the national container to think about, um, you know, both historical, you know, trans-historical and, you know, Transregional connections, um, and they of course bring into our um, vision of analysis, uh, you know, things that have been occluded. They bring into visibility things that we oftentimes have ignored or just don't want to see, which makes them very exciting frameworks. But uh, um, uh, as I'm very much aware from my own work, there are of course always um, weaknesses or even dangers in taking the oceanic or these vast and sort of macro frameworks of analysis is because um, they actually very much evacuate our analysis of individual lived experiences, historical specificity, and really the actual real materiality of individual spaces. And they also let us get away with not uh, focusing on what actually happens with objects, with things in a network in motion when they stop being in motion, when they come to rest in specific places, in specific cultures, in specific historical moments. And so I myself see that tension in my own work and I'm sure you saw that I was trying to juggle that, those tensions in my presentation. Also my sort of disquiet that I also, you know, evacuate the doubt of its specificity. I don't know if Carollo or Keller want to jump yeah, I, in. I can uh, react to some of other of your comments too. Um, the specificity of water, I think that's that's something that also fascinates me, and maybe also something that got me started in some ways because you see, if you look at um, literature on a, on a port city and you look at the literature on waterfronts and, and uh, waterfront redevelopment, you will see water as having a very different descriptive, very different narrative than the same water uh, a kilometer over in the port itself. So whether water is described as, as dirty, polluted, etc., or it's described and, and, and visualized as a nice backdrop. So there's also, I think, work necessary that starts with the use of the term water itself. So looking at city histories and how is this term, a simple term like water used. So that's, uh, that's one call for it. And what we've just been working on is to, for example, to look at a term like uh, port cities in say UNESCO literature. So I was really fascinated by your, your Lamu story too, because the, it, what, I'll put the, the, the article in the chat too, but when you look at the uh, UNESCO abstracts on port cities, they are in very, in many ways, repeating or enshrining, you could say, a story that is shaped by colonialism, military, slave trade, etc. What can we do by analyzing this to also change it? and to add stories about this port cityscape that is much larger and much more complex and make clear that these global relations that existed in the past continue to be influential on the way even we describe our heritage. So that would be another point. And that is also where what we're trying to do now with mapping come in, because now we are having a discourse in English and we might just probably be ignoring all kinds of other languages and writings that come from different perspectives. 
And that's what I actually like about mapping, that it can be interpreted beyond um, often language and uh, national borders. So if, but it requires, and what we're trying to do is kind of provide, provide a platform so that you can look at, uh, say, the Mediterranean port cities that are back against mountains and compare them to the port cities of Northern Europe that are on flat shores which means there's a completely different spatial development engaging it. I realize these are kind of three different tags, but uh, maybe someone else wants to continue there. Yeah, um, Kel Keller, please. <clears throat> uh, I mean, it's a, the, the idea of scale is tricky. I'm, you know, I think um, we were also talking about in, in various parts of our three talks, a kind of apparatus that also has can maintain fluidities without water, without maritime space. You know that it 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 it, it can manage and build like Lapset or uh, other corridors in India or Malaysia um, is sort of managing to go way inland to create um, to to um, uh, keep the sort of logistical apparatus humming. Um, but I think I think you know um, back to sort of larger question of the way in which our studies of these this last five hundred years of globalizing and colonizing and capitalizing that there that there is a caution that um, one doesn't want to reproduce those habits of mind about singular enemies and singular solutions and universals and so on that. But it's really crucial, and this is following on what Priti said, but also what Carol has said, that um, you know, that what, what is the habit of mind now that is necessary to see the patchy and the partial, to see what is multiplied many times, to see, to see another logic to really stop reproducing uh, that, that same way of analyzing with universals and, and so on. Thank you. Um, Jason, is there? I, I would think that there were, is there a question in the in the text that I've missed. There are a handful of questions. Uh, I can ask one that's in the Q and A. I do ask. No, it, it's fine. It's fine. I I, I, I can ask it. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I lost. I lost it going past. If you could, <laughs> thank you. No, I. There are. Please, if you have questions, post it in the Q and A uh, as the chat gets overpopulated, and we don't have a way of forwarding that along. Uh, we do have a question in the Q and A from uh, Kanwa Aptab, one of our PhD students, who asked the concept of a DAO. Um, who asked a question about the DAO as a heterotopia um, is very productive. I'm sorry. <sighs> is very productive and fascinating. She asks, I wonder if this concept offer, also offers a history of technological exchange between these transnational pre-modern fishing and shipping communities and thinking of the ports as being a site that breeds a distinct technological knowledge. Well, thank you for that. Uh, although I would say that that's not really a question, but a beautiful observation. And, and it just goes to show how you know, how it's so important to see how quickly graduate students can already reframe somebody else's work and then um, take in a new directions. So um, I would love to hear from the graduate students uh, how, how they would think moving forward with that concept. Maybe if I, Jason, if I may uh, just add one more thing. I think this is part of the, the beauty of research on maritime flows and, and port cities, because whether you look at medieval European uh, trading cities of the Hanseatic League, where the warehouses from Hamburg to Amsterdam to Tallinn all resemble each other, it's a response to the fact that we've had the same type of containers. And that goes back to the, to the Greeks and the, the medieval, uh, the, the, the Mediterraneans and the, the, the fact that the choice of container for maritime travel has shaped the form of ports, warehouses, cranes, cities. I mean, that is, I mean, for me, this is really at the heart of when we study uh, maritime practices. And then you see that practices, technology, but also social practices will have evolved in link with these maritime, with these maritime networks. 
And if we could find ways to put this down spatially, socially, and, and, and culturally, I would be really, I mean, I think that would be wonderful because also this question of scale that you asked before, maybe one more point on it. I think the danger is often when we look at um, the globe uh, and we talk about in one sentence of Tokyo, Singapore, Los Angeles, they all become dots like an economic geography where we have just some dots with a name on it. But I think where we can be helpful and strong is also to actually lend this in specific locations so that a Tokyo is not the same as a New York or another city. If I can just um, um, sort of expand on that or take it in a slightly different direction, I think one of the um, sort of like major interventions of Nidhi Mahajan's use of uh, the heterotopia, um, you know, and of course it's based on her like incredible fine grained field work of many years working with um, DAO captains in various um, locations, but also, you know, I also see it from my own um, um, time of living in Mombasa and Zanzibar, which were my primary research field sites. Um, uh, the point of the Heritopia is also though that, um, and also what the students uh, intervention was, I think, uh, to point out, um, of course, there are very way, um, um, in many ways how global trade forces sort of a sameness or a compatibility across great distances. Um, but of course, what's fascinating is that the Dow continues even in the face of the containership, um, you know, taking precedence. And in fact, if you go to specific um, ports uh, on the Swahili coast, they uh, don't, you know, they're, mo they're different little nodules, if you would like to look at it that way, where different types of ships fit. So there's a sort of a huge difference of scale or difference of uh, um, technology layering on top of each other. The Dow is usually seen as some sort of, um, pre-modern or ancient charming holdover, but of course it's not, but the Dow does not fit in the same uh, port as the container ships do, but are strikingly modern and contemporary still and very relevant. And Lamu is being, the Lamu is being deepened significantly in order to handle those giant. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, that, you know, by the way, are going up to make sure that oil from South Sudan can make it to um, the coast. Then, then maybe if I can put in one more thought when uh, Keller made these excellent points about ropes tying the ship together. And when you just think about ropes and the number of streets, at least in, in, in Europe, that have ropes, or the, the term or rope making in, the, in their names, you really see how this sea machines are anchored in the, in the physical landscapes. Um, sorry, Jason, were you, I, I was gonna ask another question, but did I miss something that went by in the chat No. Yeah, there was another question that was um, posted in the chat that asked, um, effectively that asked uh, that many of the papers here are thinking about certainly like how uh, the sea kind of impacts kind of terrestrial land landscapes, the kind of break of the moving between, you know, primacy of the sea and how that impacts uh, landscapes uh, in the terrestrial sphere. But asking here how, um, potentially within the case of the Caribbean, um, looking at colonial networks, exchanges of commodities, um, how, did, uh, how did plantations perhaps shape the perception of the sea? Uh, here referencing Glissant's notion of the archip of archipelago thinking. So I suppose the notion of um, how does maybe the consumption or operations of, of, of certain activities that are, that are land-based, that are reliant on the sea, uh, in this case, which was issues of, of slavery, certainly in the in the Caribbean context, how does that kind of cycle back, perhaps, and um, impact and influence perception, the cultural perception of the sea? Well, I was going. I was going to ask, um, actually, Carol, to, to talk a little, just selfishly, to ask about to, to ask about labor and oil. Um, you know, you're talking about sort of morphologies of uh, uh, on of ports and so on being changed by practices and apparatuses in the sea. Um, but you know, I think it's worth pointing out that 
there are also laws that are to carry on with sort of uh, fluid metaphors that are lubricating uh, laws and, and, and what is accepted socially, uh, uh, whatever forms of brutality are accepted socially, that are also lubricating the, the morphology of on land and on sea vessels. Uh, obviously. I mean, in the case of slavery, we that's very vivid to us. I don't think it is as vivid uh, to us the ways in which uh, free zones with no taxes and no labor regulation are, um, it's not as visible to us because as I was trying to point out, it's kind of diced up like packet switching in a digital <laughs> network, uh, diced up and recombined in different places. So the ways in which people are shipped um, or, uh, or the ways in which they migrate is lost between different jurisdictions that are allowed to hide consequence. Um, I, shall do you want to go, Preeta? Um, I will. You know, I think it was. I, I'm. I'm. Don't think I fully understood the question, but I do think it's a very in, insightful and interesting um, uh, possibility. You know, sort of uh, concern to think about. You know, the plantation and the port city in relationship to each other. Um, and of course, they are deeply entwined and imbricated with each other. Um, in in there are, in fact, if you look at it uh, in terms of, you know, histories of consumption and labor and uh, production of commodities, they are not actually discontinuous at all. And um, the physical boundary that we think we see between land and sea is actually not relevant to those kind of movements. And I can speak certainly um, historically, from the perspective of the east coast of Africa, that um, you know the boundary of the coast was not actually a stoppage, right? Overland trade routes were completely, you know, seamlessly connected to oceanic trade routes. And I, I think I took your question going in a different way, so I'll try to answer it, and then you can uh, see what you think. I think you also asked the question, what about the human and the oil transport? And I think there's different levels of human. So we talked about slavery. Uh, we talked about a bit about working conditions on ships. I think what, what the oil story also adds into that is the is like the, um, the, the, the housing for the engineers that I talked about. It's not always about bad working conditions. It's also about generating highly paid jobs at a certain moment. And so that is another factor to look in uh, who were the, yes, we need to look at housing for the oil workers. Often these were actually paid for in areas where no housing existed, like in Abadan and other places. These were built for them and they were often not necessarily, um, they were often quite good places. If you look in China, there's an article in the Oil Spaces book by Li Hu, on, on housing for workers. And you certainly also have nice big res, uh, residences. So it's, it's a multifaceted picture that needs a local uh, analysis. But the other point I was going to make, one of my PhDs just finished his uh, PhD on Monday, uh, worked on Dunkirk and legal questions because you also asked about legal issues. And what you, one, what you only see shifting is this awareness of the harm, the environmental harm that can come from um, refineries in particular. So the, where the oil is shipped and these are often in, in, in uh, port sites. And that happens only after Seveso and there's a whole legislation that comes into place to protect people living next to the port. This little housing district in Dunkirk is then being demolished today because it's just too close to the oil sites. But in, in terms of legislation, and that's the topic of his PhD, so you, you, could, you could take a look at that, we often don't have a documentation of where historic oil sites were. So you might have a refinery and today people are growing plants and their gardens on them just because there has never been a historic line, a clear line of what has happened on a specific lot. 
Uh, and so even as legislations are kicking in you, they might not be, be really making you aware of the historical depth and, and, and really, really the, the oil heritage that is uh, sitting in the soil. So that's a, that yet another dimension to say that the impact of oil on humans can be on the citizens and not just on the workers, on the ships, in the refineries, et cetera. It is actually the entire population that can be affected by it, including where the wind blows and much of the fumes from the ships are hitting port city population, coastal populations that have no say in where these ships go or what they do. So just an idea to expand a bit our focus on sea machines and the, and the human. Thank you. I am looking at the time and I think we've reached the end of the first session. I would like to thank our first group of panelists for an incredible start to the Sea Machines Symposium. Thank you, Keller, Carola, and Prida. Um, we now have a break uh, until 1 um, p.m. Come back, please, to this. Use the same link that you used to um, come in for this morning. And we'll uh, begin again at 1 o'clock Eastern time this afternoon. Thank you.